You may be seated. And let's pray together. Our good, gracious, powerful God, we thank you for your meticulous sovereignty over all things that will bring us to the glorious end we just sang about. We pray that we might mean these words with hearts filled with confidence in your perfect purpose. And we ask it for your glory. Would you use your word this morning to accomplish these things in us? Amen. All right, we're going to call an audible this morning. And Matt York, before you leave the room, Jeremy, Krista, Josh, we should sing that song again at the end of this sermon. We just pre-preached the sermon through that song. We go to there, okay. We are in Romans 8, 28 this morning, so I invite you to turn your Bibles there. But I want to introduce Romans 8, 28 with a scene from the book of Esther. And you remember the story of Esther. Ahasuerus is king. Esther is chosen to be a queen. And her uncle Mordecai saves the king from a murderous overthrow, from a conspiracy against the king. But Haman has it out for Mordecai, and Haman has it out for the Jews, and he wants to bring about a destruction of God's people, and he wants to use the powers of the government to exterminate God's people. In Esther 5.14, we read this. Uh, Haman is telling his own wife and his friends, um, is being told by them what, what they should do. Uh, how, how can Haman exact his hatred upon the Jews? Their recommendation is, have a gallows 50 cubits high made, and in the morning ask the king to have Mordecai hanged on it, and then go joyfully with the king to the banquet. It's quite a recommendation. In Esther 6.6, 6, Haman came in and spoke to the king, what is to be done, and the king said to him, what is to be done for the man whom the king desires to honor? Haman thought the king was going to honor Haman, and the king has set his heart on honoring Mordecai, the Jew. So Haman, full of himself, tells the king what should be done. Haman said, for the man whom the king desires to honor, let him bring a royal robe which the king has worn, the horse in which the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown has been placed. And let the robe and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble princes, and let them array the man whom the king desires to honor, and lead him on horseback through the city square, and proclaim before him, thus it shall, thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. And you know the delicious turn, the irony here, tragic irony for Haman, glorious turn of events for God's people in chapter 6, we, we read that Haman is forced to honor Mordecai. The king said to Haman, take quickly the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so for Mordecai the Jew. And so Haman took the robe and the horse, and he arrayed Mordecai, and he led him on horseback through the city square, and he proclaimed before Mordecai, thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. And you can just... Read the sorrow in Haman's voice there. We see on display God's love for his people. And the tragic irony for Haman in 710 is they hanged Haman on the gallows which he had prepared for Mordecai. And thus the king's anger subsided. What we have here on display is God's love for his people and God's employment of his people's enemies for his people's good. And that is exactly what's taking place in Romans 8.28. Instead of merely just one princely ruler employed by God for the good of his people, every atom of the universe 
is thus employed. Every circumstance is thus employed. Every persecution, every trial, every evil thing, every sin is thus employed for God's good purposes, for his glory, for the benefit of his own people. That is Romans 8.28. And and you know Romans 8.28. You have memorized Romans 8.28. You have rehearsed Romans 8.28. And and I know the long name of this verse is the letter of Paul the Apostle to the Christians at Rome, the the 8th chapter and the 28th verse. That's its long name. We're just going to give it a nickname this morning and call it as a friend, 828. This is 828. If this verse is not a friend to you, if this verse is not familiar to you, my prayer is that it would be so, that this verse would walk with you all of your days and be your companion. We will need the truths of this verse. This is all about God's meticulous sovereignty securing the believer's highest good. God's meticulous sovereignty secures, Christian, your highest good. We're going to unfold this promise so that we can cling to it by observing four features. We'll look at the the fact that this is critical information. We'll observe God's sovereign operation. We'll look at a glorious termination and then an important qualification. Let's look together at Romans 8.28 and let's read this. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. And God says through the Apostle Paul these glorious words. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Let's look first at the fact that this is critical information. Paul begins this verse by simply saying, and we know. This is a continuation of the development of the theme of the security of the believer in the promises of God through the work of Christ and the indwelling power and work of the Holy Spirit. That God will not lose his own, but will in fact keep his own. We go from no condemnation in the first part of the chapter to no separation at the end of the chapter. And all of this is about the security of those who are truly in Jesus Christ. In addition to everything else that Paul has detailed for us up to this point, he gives us this further critical information, and we know something. In verse 27, God is said to have known something. He knows the mind of the Holy Spirit who dwells in believers, so that the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf with prayers we don't understand, so that our lives are in keeping with God's perfect will. God knows the work of the Spirit in dwelling us. And here in verse 28, we are said to know something. We are said to know something. And this is remarkable because this this is what Jesus does in John 15, 15 with his disciples in the upper room. He says, I no longer call you slaves, but friends. Why do I give you friend status? And it's true that a disciple of Jesus Christ will always be a slave. Jesus said uh, to his disciples in Luke, "When, when you've finished everything you were supposed to do, just say we are unworthy slaves. That's still true. Slave is one of the predominant descriptions of a Christian in the New Testament. But a a slave of Jesus Christ is also elevated to a level of friendship. Why? In John 15, 15, because he knows what his father is all about. He, He knows his father's business. A slave in a household wasn't privy to inside information, but a son was. And here, you and I in Romans 8, 28, we get to know something. We get to know something of the mind of God, and while we may not know all of the details or the the mechanics and the operations of how this works out in intimate detail, we do know that God is up to something in every circumstance of our lives. God is doing something, and and he didn't have to put Romans 8.28 in our Bibles. If if he had left it out, he could still do what 8.28 promises, and, and we wouldn't know, but what a kindness of God to lift the veil for us just a little bit. And to give us this needed comfort that God is invested with all of the events and circumstances and moral agents in his universe, employed to his end for the good of his people. God lets us know that that's what he is doing. What a privilege to be let into the mind of God in this. Tremendous comfort for us in the midst of vexing circumstances. 
And Paul says, we know this. This is collective. Christians know this. We know this together. There is a collective theological awareness as believers in Jesus Christ, as we walk through the pilgrimage of this life. And, and what would life be like if we don't know Romans 8.28? We would be surprised, knocked about, confused, shaken by our various circumstances. What is life like to the degree that we do know 828? We can have a, a life of stable, joy-filled confidence, regardless of circumstances. Knowing that all of these circumstances are employed by our good God who loves us and who keeps us. Do you know 828? How well do you know 828? And what is it that we know? We know that our sovereign God is meticulous in his orchestration of everything. This is the critical information that we must know. This is God's sovereign operation. Sovereign operation. That is, God causes all things to work together. Some of your English translations say that all things work together. And the English translations are about 50-50. What is the subject of the sentence? In, in some of your English Bibles, God is the subject of the sentence. God causes all things to work together. In some of your English Bibles, things is the subject of your sentence. All things work together. Which is it? In the original, it is most likely the, the grammatical subject of the sentence is things. Is things. Uh, some versions have God as the subject, um, but most likely the subject is things. That is, things work together, and, and the verb here is where we get our uh, English word for synergism. Uh, they work together for good. Now, these things do not meander toward good by their own power. Notice how verse 28 continues. These are according to God's purpose. Clearly, God is the actor here. God is the one who is the subject of the sentence in verses 29 and 30, which continues the support for verse 28. All of these things that work together synergistically in the universe work according to God's purpose to serve God's people and it can truly be said that God is the cause of all of these things working together. This is why it is legitimate for English Bibles to say God causes all these things to work together. They're not operating on their own. The context here makes it very clear that God is the guarantor of the outcome of verse 28. Notice that verse 29 begins with the explanatory for... For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. All of this is God's unbreakable chain of salvific activity for believers from eternity past to eternity future. No one is slipping through the cracks. There is a predestination unto conformity to the image of Christ. This is all God's work. You see, traffic jams do not have the power in themselves to accomplish your conformity to Christ, Christian. They don't own that desire. They don't have that power. Cancer does not have in and of itself the ability to work that kind of miraculous transformation. God is the cause of all things working together to one glorious end. This is why your translations, some of them say, God causes all things. It reflects the truth of all of Scripture. Psalm 119, 91 says, All things are your servants, O God. This English word uh, where we get synergy, the idea is collusion. God is orchestrating everything, making everything operate together and work together towards his own glorious purpose. And what are the all things that God has in view here that Paul writes about? When Paul says all things work together for good, he means that there are no things that can ultimately bring about your harm. All things would include, but is certainly not limited to, the attributes and purposes of God, the offices of Christ and the work of Christ, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the operating power of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. Angels, Hebrews 1.14 says they are ministering spirits sent to render service to the saints. God's word certainly would be included in these all things. 
But I think what Paul has here primarily in view in Romans 8 are the difficult things. Things which in and of themselves are evil, bad, unpleasant, untimely, uncomfortable, or unlovely. Sodium is a highly reactive and dangerous element. It's the most explosive of the alkaline metals. You throw it in water and it gives off hydrogen gas and explodes. And it's very dangerous all by itself. Chlorine also is very dangerous. It was used as a weapon of mass destruction in the form of chlorine gas. But you put sodium and chlorine together and you get NaCl, right? Sodium chloride. What is that? Table salt. It's great on a watermelon. Not everybody agrees. It's useful, helpful. There is a synergy of harmful chemicals producing a beneficial result. All things in Paul's view would include here, but not limited to, all the stuff at the end of chapter 8. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, death, slaughter. It would include adverse circumstances, traffic jams, hurricanes, difficult employers, lazy employees, exasperating parents and rebellious children, inconveniences, and cancer. All things include suffering, chastisement, temptation, even our own sin. And I know not everyone likes the idea of God's meticulous sovereignty. Something about that may sound scary, especially in a, in a country built on the foundations of individual freedom and autonomy. It seems to step on the toes of, of a supposed human freedom that doesn't actually exist. And we think that perhaps the meticulous sovereignty of God may remove human agency or human accountability. But this is actually not how these things work. If you think back to Habakkuk chapter 1, God was employing the wicked Chaldeans to bring about his useful purposes of chastisement upon the nation of Israel. But the Chaldeans weren't robots. They had wills, they had minds, they had desires, and they were just doing what they wanted to do. But God was superintending their historical activities to bring about his perfect plan. And then God would hold them accountable for sinning. In Genesis chapter 20, verse 6, you have Abimelech the king when Abraham was scared of Abimelech and, and he, his wife Sarah was beautiful. He was afraid that Abimelech would kill Abraham and take Sarah to be his own wife. And so Abraham says, yeah, she's my sister. And then Abimelech takes her. Not recommendable behavior if you're a husband. And God comes to Abimelech in a dream in the middle of the night and says, you're a dead man. The woman you have in your household, she's married. <laughs> she belongs to Abe. And Abimelech said, I didn't touch her. God's response in Genesis 20, verse 6 is, I know that in the integrity of your heart, you did not touch her. And I did not let you touch her. What's going on there? Abimelech is responsible and accountable for his activities. And God is sovereign over every detail, meticulously. Even over the moral activities of moral agents in his universe. I wouldn't pretend to explain how those things work together, but the fact that they work together is clear testimony of Scripture. Human beings are, are not automatons that operate without a will, without desire. Sinful men do what they want to do, and they are held accountable for it. And yet God, behind and through it all, is orchestrating everything exactly according to His perfect plan for His glory, for the fulfillment of His perfect purpose, for the good of His people. By the way, a universe without the meticulous sovereignty of God would be far more scary than God stepping on our toes. Listen, your good depends on God's meticulous sovereignty. He's good, he's holy, he always does what is right, he makes promises, and he can keep his promises because he is meticulously sovereign. This promise can only be made by an omnipotent God who knows everything, is everywhere, all the time, and who can overrule the intentions of sinful people who can employ the actions of evil agents, who can use the cursed elements of a broken world, tie together the incalculable numbers of circumstances and contingencies, and conduct them all as a grand orchestra in one glorious symphony. 
And the song is his purpose for his glory and for our good. I would suggest to you that the theme of your Bible is the glory of God as king. I think that summarizes everything the Bible contains. And here, the glory of God as king intersects with your greatest need on your darkest days in your most hopeless situations. God is committed to ensuring that nothing can separate you from his love. He is committed with all of his wisdom, power, and sovereign care to ensuring that everything works together to bring about good for you. A friend of mine, Jerry Singleton, said this, God does not waste anything, especially pain, grief, and sorrow, especially for those for whom his son died and whom he loves with an interminable love. You have to know something about Jerry Singleton to make this quote make sense. He was a seven-year POW in the Hanoi Hilton, shot down over Vietnam as an unbeliever, heard the gospel as a POW, and came to faith in Christ. And if you know anything about the POWs in the Hanoi Hilton, they were all broken. They were all tortured beyond belief. And God brought him to himself. And so Jerry said, God does not waste anything, especially pain, grief, and sorrow, especially for those for whom his son died and whom he loves with an interminable love. That is God's sovereign operation. And it leads to a glorious termination. Where does all of this go? It it, it is for our good. It is for good. God is good and God does good. And so the glorious end of his purpose is good. What is the good that Paul has in mind here in 828? The good that every element of the universe labors for under God's detailed care. And here we must be very careful. Our definition of good is tremendously important in our understanding of this promise. If we fail to see good the way the infinitely wise creator and sustainer of the universe sees good, then we may be tempted to set our sights on mediocre or even detrimental. We may even be disappointed when we get good in the place of mediocre or detrimental. What good is not? The removal of all difficulty, harm, pain, and discomfort. God does not define good for us this way, the provision of all ease, safety, pleasure, and comfort. Sometimes I'm tempted to impose my own perversion onto the word good. And then I make the promise and the qualification of 828 sound something like this. If I love God enough, then he's obligated to bless me in the ways I think I need blessing. Now listen, material blessing might be good for us at a given time but it may also prove detrimental to what is ultimately good. Ultimate good is something so much better than temporary comfort or the accumulation of stuff. Biblically, things are good in our lives are things like real and lasting joy, Christian maturity, practical wisdom, passion for the glory of God, personal humility, love towards others, Christ-likeness, Communion with God. These are good. Psalm 73, the nearness of God is my good. Psalm 34, 8, taste and see that Yahweh is good. These things are always good. There are other things which may be good or bad depending on what ultimate end they serve. If, for instance, the steady job great income, reliable vehicles, obedient children, healthy family, a winning sports team, cause you to be spiritually lazy, self-sufficient, independent, proud, and prayerless, then they may not be the best for you just now. We have to value things according to eternal realities. When we define good the way God defines good, then we begin to see all things as servants to the purpose of God in our lives. The good Paul has in mind is specified here in our context. Look down at 828. 
We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. I think I know what good is. Keep reading verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. There's the good. There's the ultimate good. Conformity to Christ, qualifying us to enjoy God's presence, to not be incinerated by his glory, but to actually revel in it in infinite, never-ending, ever-increasing delight. That's the good. This is the good that creation is longing for in Romans 8, 19, the glorification of the sons of God. And I can see how some things naturally lead to this good end. Right? Reading my Bible, I can see how that is designed to make me more like Christ. I can see how the angels employed by God as servants of the saints in our pilgrimage, I don't know what they do, I don't know when they do it, but I can see how angels are employed by God for my glorious end. It's what they intend to do and they don't sin. I can understand how the attributes of God and the work of Christ and the ministry of the Holy Spirit lead to my good. But cancer, trials, persecutions, enemies, how, how do these things accomplish my conformity to Christ, my ultimate good? The promise of 828 is that God causes all things to work together synergistically to accomplish your good. And it's not as if God sees a lemon and says, oh man, there's a lemon, didn't see that coming, I need to make some lemonade out of it. It's much more intentional. God designs and intends in all of this to accomplish what he has set out to accomplish. Listen, a traffic jam on the 101 cannot alter the truth of 828. 828 would not flinch at a world of traffic jams. Why? Why? Because God is in charge of them. He's in charge of them. And a traffic jam does not in and of itself have the power or intention of making you like Christ. But God superintends every circumstance to that end. Another way to state this is what Douglas Moo has said in his commentary on this verse. There is nothing in this world that is not intended by God to assist us on our earthly pilgrimage and to bring us safely and certainly to the glorious destination of that pilgrimage. Nothing can ultimately work against you. Everything is actually working together for you. This is a glorious promise. This is a promise from God that changes everything. Everything is a servant of God for the good of His children. The world, the fall, redemption, every providential act, every event... The scripture is full of examples of this kind of thing. We see this in Job's suffering. Job says in Job 23.10, But God knows the way I take, and when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job at some points understood the relationship between suffering and the refining process of God. 1 Peter chapter 1 talks about the refining process of God, of God that uses trials to refine our faith like precious gold that comes through the fire. In 2 Corinthians 12, you remember Paul prayed three times for that thorn in his side, the messenger of Satan, to be removed, and, and God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul tells us the reason the thorn was important, he says, to keep me from exalting myself, the thorn was given me. What good did that thorn in his side accomplish? Humility, dependence on the Lord, kept Paul from exalting himself. These things refine our faith, they purify our devotion, they strengthen our hope, they increase our longing for heaven. Chastisement, correction, trials, they have this result. The psalmist expressed these things in Psalm 119. I'll give you just a few examples. Verse 67 of Psalm 119. The psalmist writes, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and you do good. Afflictions caused the psalmist to meditate on God's goodness because of what they produced. Psalm 119, 71, it is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. 
and 119.75. I know, O Yahweh, that your judgments are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. In faithfulness. Faithfulness to God's own character and his own purposes and his commitment to love his own people. God is faithful and the affliction comes. Consider temptation, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has come upon us except what is common, and God always provides a way of escape. Even temptation, superintended by God, is designed in the Christian life to draw us in closer dependence upon the Lord. And our own sin. Here's a great comfort. Sin itself is evil, and and sin has consequences, and sin is abhorrent in the eyes of God, and and yet it is not stronger than God, powerfuller than God. It does not usurp God's purpose, nor His promise, nor His plan, nor His love. And there's nothing in sin intrinsically that has any redeeming value, but our omnipotent and compassionate Heavenly Father takes even our own sin and makes it His servant for His glory and for our good. Think about how God has used your own sin to accomplish His purposes in your life. When God brings conviction to your heart, you confess, you repent, and God does through that some very good things, devastating spiritual pride, self-reliance, independence, brings deep humiliation, godly sorrow. He produces a greater awareness of depravity and its effects produces a greater awareness of the deceitfulness of our own hearts. He draws us to praise God for His mercy and His grace. We get fresh views of God's goodness and long-suffering. It brings us again to the cross, the greatest example of God's using evil to accomplish His perfect ends. And at the cross, we review all over again the good news. This renews our longing for heaven. This creates in us a greater compassion for others. Again, there is nothing in this world that is not intended by God to assist us on our earthly pilgrimage and to bring us safely and certainly to the glorious destination of that pilgrimage. Everything is God's servant for your good. That leads us to the last portion of 828, an important qualification. 828 is not all things for good. Everything's going to be all right. It'll all work out. Life is good. That is not the message of 828. It is not a blind optimism as if the universe, by some intrinsic operating principle, is looking out for you, sort of generally aligned with your ideal quality of life and your personal comfort. World history and your own experience obliterate such cotton candy sentimentality. You see, 828 is not for everybody. And here's the important qualification. This promise applies to every and only to Christians. And a Christian is defined and described in two ways in 828. Those who love God and those called according to His purpose. These are the only people for whom 828 works. Those who love God and are called according to His purpose. These are two ways to define and describe a genuine Christian. First of all, to those who love God, and in the original, this is thrown forward in the sentence. It's highly emphatic. The the, the sentence starts out, to those who love God, 828. We can't miss this. And this doesn't mean that the promise applies to you only when you love God enough. No, if you are a Christian then the basic internal direction of your life is to love God. To be a Christian, by definition, is to love God, and therefore the promise applies. A friend of mine said, you're not a Christian until you love God. That's what a Christian does. The love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. This is part of what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. And 828 is not the only place that Christians are defined this way. 1 Corinthians 2.9, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for whom? For those who love him. For Christians. 1 Corinthians 8.3, if anyone loves God, he is known by him. James 1.12, the crown of life is promised to those who love him. 
Romans 5.5 5 says that God has poured out his love in our hearts. You see, loving God is a definition of a Christian from the human perspective. And we know that we love him because he first loved us. Robert Haldane said, In loving God, the affections of the believer terminate in God as their last and highest end. And this they can do in God only. Christians, by definition, love God, and, and they love Him supremely above all things. Not perfectly, but the pattern of a life of a Christian is love for God. This definition implies two things. All Christians love God, and only Christians love God. Only Christians love God. All non-Christians despise God, despite what they may claim. Listen, I know people who claim to love God, but don't particularly like the God of the Bible. They're not passionate about His glory. Their their hearts are not stirred with affection for Him as He's revealed Himself in Scripture. To, To make up a God of our own imagining and then set our affections on that is not love for God. That's actually hatred for God and rebellion against God. People say, my God would never send anyone to hell. Or people live like, oh yeah, I love God. I've got a category for God in my life. He's over in this corner, but I don't want anybody telling me what to do. Such people do not really love the true and living God. They love the God of their own imagination. Ironically, only the omnipotent, sovereign, sin-hating, yet compassionate God that Scott spoke of this morning can make and keep a promise like 828. All Christians love God as the basic inner direction of their hearts because God himself has put that love there and has changed the heart. If you don't see love for God in this way, then you need to come to God and ask him to change your heart, to give you a love that only he can produce. And that changed heart manifested in love for God is visible in varying degrees and in various ways. What does the Bible say love for God looks like? It looks like, number one, personal communion with God. As the deer pants for the water, the psalmist wrote in Psalm 42, so my soul longs for you. It looks like trust in him. To to love him is to trust in him. You can write down Psalm 31, verse 23. To love God is to obey him. You can write down John 14, 21, John 15, 14, and 1 John 5, 3. You can't say you love God if you hate the brethren, if you don't love God's word, if you don't actually obey him. Love for God means a sensitivity to the glory of God. That is, you're you're eager to defend his reputation in the world. You, you, You love the honor of his name and you don't like it when his name is dishonored. To love God means you love what he loves and you hate what God hates. We learn to hate sin and hypocrisy and evil in the world out there and especially in the world in here. And to love God means to long for God's return. Thy kingdom come. Come, Lord Jesus. You cannot wait for God's glory and his name to be vindicated and for every knee to bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. You can't wait for that day because you love him. God will give the glorious crown, not just to Paul, 2 Timothy 4.8, but to all who have loved his appearing. That is a fundamental definition of a Christian, is one who loves God's appearing. And a Christian is defined not just as those who love God, but also in 828, as those who are called according to his purpose. This is a definition of a Christian from God's perspective. These are those who are brought by God to himself by grace through the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. That is what the calling of God means here. It is the effectual calling unto salvation by the supernatural work of God in the heart. And and, and at times, calling is used other ways. Jesus said, many are called, few are chosen. That would be the broad invitation. It would be like me standing here today and say, anybody who comes to the Savior has eternal life. Come to the Savior. A general invitation. But every time the word calling is used in the New Testament letters... 
it is used specifically of the effectual, specific calling by God the Holy Spirit in the heart where God makes you alive for the first time and you believe in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. You're given eyes to see the truth and a heart to believe it and you cast yourself on him once and forever. That is what Paul means by call here. And the calling here is a calling according to his purpose. Again, no purpose of God can be thwarted. The calling here is one of calling unto God's purpose to bring you from a sinful state of rebellion into beautiful, glorious, perfect conformity to Jesus Christ. And it cannot fail. And there is no other reason why all works for good for Christians than for God's ultimate purpose. Now, this is a glorious truth. Luther pointed out, if, if everything rested upon our purpose, how easily could any one evil thing upset it? It's true. But all of this rests on God's purpose, and His purpose is absolute and sure. 828 is secure because it is grounded in the unchangeable purpose of God. We'll look at that unfolded, Lord willing, next week as we look at verses 29 to 30. Again, 828 is not a promise for everybody. See, God dispenses good gifts, and they fall on believers and unbelievers alike. Sweet things. Relationships, friendships, a good job, provision of food, enjoyments. God gives these things. All things come from Him. All these are, are, are good gifts that come from Him, and yet... A good gift that falls on a hard heart will only produce harder hearts. And a stubborn will that receives a good gift from God will only grow more stubborn unless God intervenes. And think about hard things in life. You know any old Christians? You know the kind that have walked hand in hand with 828 for a long time? And when difficult things happen to them, they just don't move. They're a rock. Because they've learned over and over again in every adverse circumstance to trust a good and sovereign God with everything he brings into their lives because it's all directed to his glory and for their good. They've known it and they've lived it and they've trusted it. And so when hard things happen to a, to a dear old saint, they trust God. And there's joy that transcends a circumstance. And we say, how are you getting through the day? <laughs> and then you meet people for whom hard circumstances happen and, and they don't know the Lord. And the same kind of adverse circumstance produces not joy that transcends the circumstance, but bitterness. Bitterness. Do you know any old, bitter people who have hit hard time after hard time after hard time after hard time. And in God's good design, the thing that was intended to break up hard soil and turn a heart softly towards his maker has only become encrusted with more hardness. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel like you've been beat up by life and you've been rejecting the one who's been aiming at getting your attention to what life is all about. You've never yet turned from your sin. You need to know that all of the crust can go away, that new life can come in like a flood and change everything. And with new life, 828, the promise of a sovereign God that guarantees everything working for your glorious good. 828 is for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And there's nothing new here. This theme goes all the way back to the first book in the Bible. You know, the last third of Genesis is about Joseph and the things he went through, sold into slavery. You know, some of his brothers had murderous intent. Others just wanted to cover up their jealousy. And they threw him in a hole, eventually sold him into slavery, and he was carted off to Egypt and then wrongfully imprisoned. And when Joseph met the brothers again, do you remember what he said? Genesis 50, 20. That's the Old Testament version of 828. If you just want to walk around with 50, 20 and 828, they, they both work. He told the brothers, 
You intended it for evil. But God intended it, same it, for good. All of it. And there was temporal good in that. There was situational good that the brothers felt in their own lifetimes, that Joseph experienced in his own lifetime. And there was a greater glorious ultimate good brought about by those things. The line of Judah was preserved, meaning the line of Messiah was preserved. And Jesus was born at Bethlehem, went to the cross, died and paid for sins. And we can all have our sins forgiven because Joseph's brothers threw him in a hole. Satan, with murderous intent, who commandeered the political powers and the religious institutions of Palestine in the first century. Satan, he had the media, he had the military, he had the, 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 the realm of philosophy and ideas. And Satan even had an inside plot. I mean, way inside. Judas, one of the twelve. It, could, could Satan get, get in amongst the inner circle of the, of the followers of Jesus? He didn't just influence Judas, he indwelt Judas. Satan got way inside in this plot to murder Jesus. And what do we find out? This is what Jesus was planning from before the foundation of the world. And Satan, much smarter than any of us in this room, duped, overruled, superintended, orchestrated by the master conductor of all things to accomplish exactly what God had intended from the foundation of the world. You ever think about that? Satan wanted to murder Jesus. Jesus said, I came to lay down my life. And the murderous plot of Satan met perfectly with the orchestrated plan of God because God orchestrates all things. How do we know when we know 828? How can we assess of our own hearts, do we truly believe this promise from God? Well, ask yourself, how does my heart respond to my circumstances? How does my heart respond to pleasant circumstances? Do I see them as gifts from the Lord, a foretaste of heaven and, and an opportunity for me to rejoice in Him? Or do they turn my heart to idolatries, to worship and serve the created thing rather than the Creator? How does your heart respond to adverse circumstances? Am I quick to complain, question God's judgment, long to rewrite the script? When we see, as Joseph did, that while enemies might intend something for evil, God is always causing everything to work for our good. That's when we know that we know 828. And many times the fulfillment of 828 is eschatological. That is, it's at the end. It's, it's eternal fulfillment when we are brought into perfect conformity with Christ. Jim Elliot didn't see what, God, what good God intended when the people he was trying to preach the gospel to speared him through and left his body on the banks of the Kurure River in Ecuador. William Tyndale did not see the good that God intended in his circumstances when he was betrayed by a friend while trying to translate the New Testament into English. We all get to read this because of what Tyndale was doing. Betrayed by a friend and murdered. But sometimes we get glimpses into the temporal work of God's use of all things for our good. Keith Green sang a song called Trials Turned to Gold. And he speaks in that song about moments of clarity where you see that, oh, that's why God is bringing this affliction into my life. He's doing something to bring me into conformity with Christ. This is a trial turned to gold. I see the value in this. Sometimes we get glimpses of that in our own life. William Carey, after spending years working on Bible translations into some 20 different languages, saw his library of manuscripts burned to the ground, and he had to start from scratch with all of that work. And his response? 
God saw fit that these 20 languages needed better translations than I gave them the first time. Tragically, when William Tyndale was working on New Testament translation into English so that we could read this God's word, his enemies were conspiring against him, and and one of his enemies purchased all the ones that he could find. Many of those still made it into the hands of English readers. And the proceeds from that actually gave Tyndale the funds he needed to pay off some debts and produce a better translation. But of course, the final realization of this promise occurs when we arrive in glory. When we will see firsthand the good that God has produced by every adverse circumstance, every evil intention, and every sin. We will learn the ways that God has made our enemies serve us as friends. When even Satan's strategies become like Haman's wicked designs. We express our confidence in God when we welcome as friends anything that God brings into our lives, knowing that he is already making them servants for our good. How do you know when you believe 828? When things like adversity, persecution, hardship, sickness, family difficulty, temptation, when they take on new character, when you see them as servants of God for your good, When in the moment of trial, you see, as Haldane said, God turns to good things that are in themselves most pernicious, and you begin to embrace what God is doing through them. To the glory of God and for our own good, may our enemies become our dear friends until we arrive in glory. Let's pray. Jesus, I, my cross, have taken all to leave and follow thee. Come disaster, scorn, and pain. All of these things are on a short leash before you, O God. They obey your every command. They comply with your perfect purpose. None of them can overrule your plan and purpose to bring us into perfect conformity with the glory of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We long for that day. We groan for that day. May our song join that of all of creation, which cranes the neck, eagerly looking for the glory of the sons of God. God, would you teach us to embrace those afflictions and good gifts that come from your hand your good, sovereign, loving care. And may we embrace them as servants for our sake, servants for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name.